Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, because I'm not in the room with you, I know you may have some questions as we go through, if you'll just hold them till the end and we can all visit about them at that time. So my name is Debbie Gertler. I work for Family Search at the Family History Library, which I lovingly call Mecca. Every genealogist should come there at least once in their life, right? So um, we're gonna be talking today about brick wall methodology. And this class is specifically designed for Hispanic ancestors, but if many of the principles apply to ancestors from other parts of the world as well, including the US and um, Europe or wherever, wherever they might be. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we'll talk a little bit today and I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off for a minute just to save some bandwidth while I give the presentation. And then I'll put it back on when it's time for questions. All right, so in today's presentation, we're going to be talking about some research strategies, how to locate some records, what are some strategies you can do to overcome record loss. We all hate when that happens, but it does happen. And then I'll show you, talk to you also about some online sources that you can use to find more help if you get stuck with your brick wall and you need help. So let's go. So research strategies, you always want to start with the basics. Make sure that you have a good solid foundation, you have um, well documented everything. You know, maybe Aunt Gertrude remembers all the names and dates and places, but it's still a good idea to back it up with some more information, um, some documentation. So make sure that you do all of those basic steps when you get started. Um, consider spelling variations. Um, we're also going to talk about some pedigree analysis, and I'm going to go through more of these a little bit more in depth as we go through, but this is just to give you an idea. Um, we'll talk about the importance of doing full family research and the FAN club approach. The FAN is an acronym for Friends, Associates, and Neighbors, coined by Elizabeth Stone Mills, and it's a very good strategy for trying to identify brick wall ancestors. We'll also talk about creating a timeline and then making sure that you exhaust the all possible records for the life events of your ancestors. Sometimes there may be clues in all of those records in one of those records that maybe you didn't look at that might help you to break down that brick wall. So let's start with these research strategies. So when you're working with a US ancestor, make sure that you find them in every possible census that they could appear in. And especially true if there are state or local censuses as well, try to um, figure out where they were living, what they were doing, who was with the family, and start gathering all of the clues that you can find. And then I also highly recommend, given the time period, because some time periods you don't have these, but find every vital record that you can find. Every birth, every marriage, every death, any of those records that will help you to build that solid foundation of information about your ancestor. Next, make sure that you identify all family members. I know we sometimes like to focus in on our direct line, but sometimes the good, the good information to break down that brick wall is found in the record of his brother or his sister. So it's important that we look at all of the family members and to identify them. Now, if you have ancestors from Latin America, and I will tell you, and I didn't tell you at the outset, I'm a Latin America research specialist at the library. I'm also uh, a specialist for Southern Europe. And so I help a lot of people finding their ancestors from these localities. Um, when you're looking for ancestors from Latin America, it's equally important to make sure that you can try to find all of those vital records for your ancestor, birth, marriage, and death. And in some situations, for example, in Mexico, you may have two sets of vital records. You may have the civil registration vital records, and you may also have the Catholic Church records, depending on the time period that you're researching. So that's important to, to recognize, because sometimes one record has more information than another. And even though you've got the birth record, perhaps the baptism record, has more information that will help you to overcome your brick wall. Um, immigration records are a good source as well um, for Latin Americans, border crossings and naturalization records can provide a lot of good clues and a lot of good information. What you really wanna do is you wanna make sure that you have enough information to be able to identify them. Do you have enough information about your Juan Gomez so that if you found him in a record in Mexico or in 
um, Chile or wherever it might be, you can say, oh, yeah, that's him because this was the name of his wife. And they're both in the record. Or that was him because these are the names of his parents. Or, yeah, that's him because he also had a brother. And that's the name of the brother. So make sure when you're doing your research, um, don't go out on the end of the limb looking for your brick wall ancestor. You may have to back up, document him, document the full family. Make sure you have enough information so that if you do find somebody by the right name and in the right place, that it really is him because you can identify him through his family connections. All right, let's talk about starting with a good foundation. Now, there may be, as you're looking at your pedigree, that you're missing some dates and some places. That's when I highly recommend that you go back and document, 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 document every event in that family tree so that you can make sure that you are building a firm foundation for your research and to help you later down the road to, to be able to resolve any brick wall problems that you might face. Now, talking about spelling variations, because I work on the international floor in the library, um, you'd be amazed at how many different ways you can spell last names and first names. So consider all possible spelling variations of your ancestor's name. Think phonetically. Um, I love to tell the story of a family that I was looking for in Colorado. I knew where they should be and they should have been in a state census and I could not find him. His name was Miguel Martinez. And so I did a few wild card substitutions for some letters I thought might be misspelled or interchangeable. And sure enough, I found Miguel Martinez. I guess he was Scotch Mexican, I don't know. But the census taker wrote down Miguel and not Miguel. And so that was one of the ways that I was able to find him by substituting an asterisk for some letters that might be misspelled or easily interchanged. The other thing that you have to look at with um, foreign ancestors is language concerns. Oftentimes when they come to the US, they may not be fluent in English. And so they may misunderstand a question or they may say their name and the person who's writing the information down writes it the way he hears it, not necessarily the way it's spelled. And that brings to the next point about literacy. You know, were, were our ancestors literate? Could they even write or spell their own name? Sometimes they could, sometimes they couldn't. And if they couldn't, there was no way for them to correct the scribe or whoever was writing down the information and say, oh, no, I don't spell my name that way because they didn't know. They just took it up whatever the scribe wrote down was the correct information. So be creative when you think about these name variations and spelling variations. Now to identify the location of your ancestors, sometimes you may find in a record that they're from a particular place and you're having a hard time identifying that location. Um, Google is a really good source to go in and start typing in a name. I love that Google offers you suggested spellings and suggested ideas. That way, if the name was spelled a little bit wrong, you can go in and, and look at that and say, hey, yeah, you know what? I think that might be the right place. Um, the other thing that you want to look at is a gazetteer. A gazetteer is like a, a, ma a book of place names, and it can very often help you to identify the names of places, especially if you know a particular area, roughly the area where they might have lived. You can go through and look at a list of, of places that might be in that area that might help may also give you some background about um, bordering areas or nearby communities so that you can do a radial search if you have to if your ancestor disappears and of course the family search catalog is a good place to search for places as well you can go into our catalog on familysearch.org click on search and then catalog and then enter in how you think the name of the place is spelled I will warn you, though, that the catalog does not like misspelling. You have to spell it correctly. If you can't spell it correctly, you may want to try the places within and go to the next highest jurisdiction. So let's say you know it's in Slacala in Mexico, but you can't remember the name. And I struggle with those place names that begin with TL. So I go to places within for Slacala, and then I can see all the list of places, and then I, that will help me to find them as well. All right, let's take a look at this record here. Sometimes locality clues can be found in the records. And this is actually a marriage record 
and I'm going to blow this up a little bit. So this is a record and it tells us that the person has been living here for about 12 years and he's originally from and it looks like Caopas, C-A-H-O-P-A-S. And then, of course, you've got the names of the parents, Vicente Malero and Cayetana Garcia. So now my problem is, if he's originally from Cayopas, I need to figure out where that is. And that's where these gazetteers come in handy. One of the best ones we have for Mexico is, is what we call Garcia Cubas. It's a dic diccionario geográfico. That's the Spanish word for gazetteer. And you can go to that and you can find more information about the place. Now, H in Spanish is often silent. So when I didn't find anything that looked like C-A-H-O-P-A-S, I dropped the H and I found Cayopas. So this tells me that it's a rancho in the municipality and the district of Mazapil in the state of Zacatecas. So that means to look for um, records, I'm gonna wanna look in Mazapil because that's the municipality that's probably that will definitely be where the civil registration is located and most likely that's where the parish church is located as well so as you're going through and trying to identify the location make sure you look at all of the locations for every member of the family as that will help you to kind of pinpoint down the the location as well all right now let's take a look at some results here i have this is the same family from the record that i just showed you we, what I did was I did a search for Vicente Valero and his wife, Cayetana Garcia. And you can see I have all of these different records, but they're all from different places in Mexico. So I'm wondering, is this the same family? Is there a way that I can find out for sure if they are? Because the names of the parents all match. So one of the things that I like to do is to create a timeline of the different records that I've found and take a look and kind of see where the family um, is living or where the where the records say that they were living. So as you can see, the first few here are all from Mazapil. They have different um, parish names or Pueblo names, but this is all from Mazapil. And then we have one over here in San Juan de Guadalupe in Durango. Now, my question to myself would be, well, how far away is that from Mazapil. I would want to go to Google Maps and see what I could find about that one. And then as we get further down, you know, I've got these in chronological order by the date of the record. Um, you can see that more of the family ends up in San Juan de Guadalupe, and that those tend to be marriages. So let's take a look at my map. So one of the things that I like to do on Google is to map out places to see how far they, apart they are. So here we have Mazapil, and you can do this by going in and searching for a place and then asking for directions for the next place and then asking for directions from the next place. And it gives you an idea of about how far they are. Um, these are pretty far apart. I, I would wonder about them, but the other thing that you gotta take into consideration is they, you know, did they go, a roundabout like this, or did they go straight across? And the same thing with Viesca, between Viesca and San Juan de Guadalupe. Did they go all the way up and around like this, or did they, on foot or on burro, go straight across this way? So that's another consideration to, to take into, another thing to take into consideration. Now, another thing that you're going to want to do is a bit of pedigree analysis. So examine all the information for the entire family. Look at the documentation. Are there gaps? Are the sources valid? Are there sources attached? We hope so. Our goal is always to start out with a good foundation. If you don't have a good foundation, you're probably going to create your own brick walls because you haven't, um, haven't done enough research, enough foundational research. And you can't figure out how come you can't get any farther because you're probably missing some clues that were found in documentation. So let's take a look at this um, family tree and I'm going to pull it up live on my screen here on family search. So as I look at this, I can um, click on the names and I can see Jose Jesus Maria Cruz Arellano and I can see that he's got an exact birth date in place. That is great. And I can see also that he has seven sources. 
So what my next step to, would be, would be to go in and look at all those sources, read through those documents, make sure that they've interpreted them all correctly. And then my place to start would probably be here with his parents or down here with her parents. Now she only has an about date. So I may want to see if I can find her birth record just to verify this information or find some information about her brothers and sisters before I dig in and start to do more research before I extend myself out here on the the farthest branches of the tree. So make sure that you take a good look at the information that you've got. And then if you need to, if there were no information here, even though all these names were here, I want to document this just to make sure that I have a good solid foundation to build on. So that is very important. All right, let's go back here to our presentation. All right, so oftentimes when you look at this, you wonder, well, where do we get started? I have created a little table that works very well for most Latin American countries, it says in European countries, that because the, the countries that have um, civil registration or Catholic church records, this little um, table works very well. So if I want to look for an event from this first column, I need to make sure that I have something from these next three columns. So for example, if I'm looking for a birth or a baptismal record, a baptismal record can be a substitute for birth. I want to make sure that I know the names of the parents of the person I'm looking for or the names of some brothers and sisters so that I can properly identify him. I also need to know a date of birth or an approximate date of birth of my person or of one of his brothers and sisters because that gives me a good starting place to, to look chronologically. I also need to know where they lived or where he might have been born so that I could have a good place to be in my search for those records. So the same thing for a marriage. I need to know the names of the bride and groom or the names of parents so that I can search for them and their children and perhaps find their marriages. I need to have a rough idea of the date of marriage and that can be estimated. You can start with the birth date of the oldest child. Now I don't recommend that you go back nine months because oftentimes uh, the child might've been on the way when mom and dad got married, as long as they got married before the child was born, the child was considered legitimate. And we have often seen in the library, um, parents who, uh, a couple who marries and then has their first child the next week. So keep an open mind, our ancestors were human. So, and then you also need to have a place of marriage or a place where the family might've lived or a place where the a child was baptized. Also keep in mind with marriages that the couple often married in the hometown of the bride, if that was feasible. So always a good idea to look in her hometown first for a marriage. And then we have the same thing here for death. We won't go into those. And I believe this table is found in your handout for the class. Now, it's really important, and I've stressed this over and over, make sure you research every family member for additional clues. Look at the parents, look at the children, look at the grandchildren, look at the spouses, anybody who's connected to that family at all, whether they're in-laws or outlaws, make sure you check to see, um, check their records and look for clues, especially when you get stuck. As I mentioned, the fan club approach by Elizabeth Stone Mills. So it's friends, associates, and neighbors who are hanging out with your family, who appears in the baptisms of their children as godparents or padrinos, who are the witnesses to their marriages or to their births or their death records. Make sure that you look at all the family members. And this fan club approach is especially helpful for families that moved around a lot because they families like that often move together. And so it's important to consider that when you're looking for those families that are migratory. And then also include, if you're gonna create this fan club, make sure you include the dates and places where you found them connected. So where they interacted. And this is a strategy that I often use on my tough Southern US problems as well. So for those of you that have Southern US ancestry where the records aren't always as great. This is a, a good approach to help identify your Southern ancestors as well. All right, as you're looking at your records, make sure that you always look at the image 
oftentimes we get a, a lot of hints from indexed records, but you need to take the time to go in and read that image because there might be more clues in the record. Oftentimes in Latin America, for those of you who have done, not done research in Latin America, you're going to be so jealous. The re a baptism record may have the names of the grandparents besides the parents. So, but they don't often index that information. So you want to make sure that you go in and look at that image and read that record thoroughly. Take a note, who are the witnesses? Who are the padrinos, the godparents? Add them to your fan club so you can start building out and trying to identify these families. This is especially good technique to use when there may be two couples of the same name. So you can identify when the children were born and who were their grandparents, and especially when on the rare occasion that they don't include grandparents in the baptism record. When you're creating your timeline after you've got it created, look for gaps, especially between children or between siblings in a family. It's most common that a couple will have a child every two years or sometimes more frequently, one and a half years. So if you find a big gap of four or five years, you may be missing a child or dad may have left the home for a while to go work somewhere else. So keep that in mind as you're looking and creating your timeline. Also, look at your locations. Look at them on the map. Um, consider a migration pass. For those that came up from Mexico, normally the migration pattern is from south to north. But there are some other migration patterns, you know, from that go from different states. Like there's a huge influx of people from Monterrey and Coahuila that went up into San Antonio. And that was just a natural migration pattern that, that they followed. And so once you learn more about those different migration patterns, it'll help you to pick maybe backtrack as to where they might have came from. All right, now let's talk about locating the records. First thing you need to consider are the jurisdictions. There are different entities that create different records. So we have federal, we have state, in the US we have county, um, we have city, we have parish. So make sure that you look at all the records from all those jurisdictions from the locality that your ancestors lived in. And also keep in mind that not everything is online. There are lots of places that still don't have their records online and you may have to go visit an archive. Um, you can find out more about archives and where they're located by um, just Googling. Let's say you wanna find an archive in the city of Monclova in Coahuila, you could Google Archivo Municipal de Monclova Coahuila. I recommend that you Google in language if you're looking in another country. And generally speaking, among the first three or four results is the, the website that you're looking for with more information. There is also a site called the Censo Guia for Spain and Latin America that identifies many of the archives in those areas. And you can get to that on a site that's called Pares, which is the Portal de Archivos Españoles, it's the Spanish National Archive Portal. And again, be sure and consider all possible entities Speaking of archive entities, Made a drink there. So these are a few of the different types of archives that I've seen for Hispanics, and many of these hold true also for other parts of the world. You have your municipal municipal archives, you have your district or in Spanish comarcal archives, you have provincial, state, and departmental archives. Some areas call their their larger division states, some call, some call them province, provinces, some call them departments, but they have their archives. Um, diocesan archives and parish archives for church records, military archives when you believe your ancestor was in the military, and then national archives that might have records from all over. And in some cases that might be um, immigration records where if registers of foreign citizens living in the country, those might be kept on the national level. So those are important to know. Talking about overcoming record loss, you can use some record substitutions that might substitute very well for a missing record. Um, marriage information files are wonderful in Spain and many parts of Latin America, if you can find them because they have 
a boatload of information about the couple getting married, where if you did find a lot of information in a marriage, I would definitely look for that marriage information file. Um, a dispensation. This was something that was created by the bishop of the Catholic Church. If a couple had an impediment to the marriage, the most common impediments were related by blood or re related by marriage within four generations. This required a dispensation. And those records are generated in a diocesan archive. So if the parish archives have burned, perhaps the the diocesan archive might have a dispensation or a record there that would help you or a marriage information file. Notarial records are for your wills, your marriage contracts, land transactions, those sorts of things. Because they're important records, those types of records are often redone if, they, if there is record loss or they can substitute for, a, or they can be a substitute, for example, uh, a will where the deceased names his wife and all of his children to substitute in a parish perhaps where those records have vanished. Uh, military records can also fill in when parish and civil records have, have disappeared. Confirmations are also done by the bishop in the Catholic Church, so on the diocesan level they may survive perhaps when a parish record does not. Censuses or padrones would also help us perhaps if we're looking for all of the members of a family and there are gaps in the record, we could turn to a census, a padrone, or even a electoral list to see if we're missing some people. Also, I recommend a guided research in the Family Search Wiki. They have a whole list of substitute records that you can use that will help you when birth, marriage, and death records don't exist. They're doing that for um, they've done it all for the United States. They've done it for several other countries around the world. If you haven't given it a try, I highly recommend it. Now let's talk about some online sources for help. The Family Search community is a Family Search um, feature that you can use. It's found on the homepage of FamilySearch.org. If you click on a little question mark up in the corner. Uh, you'll see the option for community. It's a place where you can go in and ask questions. It's like a forum. So you can ask your question and get some answers. It's a great place to get translations of records if you can't read them. Um, another thing that you could consider is signing up for an online consultation from the Family History Library. We do those via Zoom. They're 20 minutes. They're free. We give you research suggestions and ideas to help you break down your brick walls or help you to get past any difficulties you might have in your tree. There are also some great Facebook groups that you can find that are good to help with research and other online groups as well. Um, I have a couple here that show um, different groups and forums in Spain. I'm going to go ahead and pull that up. So this, this site is in Spanish. For those of you that don't read Spanish, if you right click with your mouse, you should see an option to translate to English, so you can do that. But this has a whole list of regional groups that might be able to help you if you were looking for help in these particular areas. And this one is heavily focused on Spain. So there's that one. And then there's also another one that has uh, groups and forums for family history. And it, this one is found on the Family Search Wiki. And you can see they're, they're grouped by country. Again, this is in Spanish, but there's a translation button over here on the left-hand side where you can select the language and you can change it into English. But all of these are links to different groups and societies where you may be able to find help online with your family tree, with your um, family history research. Okay. So now we're going to take these principles and we're gonna do a case study today on one of the individuals. And this um, person is Mariano Estrada. And this is actually the ancestors of Christine Zoria who is being highlighted today and is being filmed for the Identity Quest. And so this was a little bit of a tough, tough one, but we were able to break it down. And I thought it would make a great case study to help you to see how those principles might be put into action. So let's go ahead and jump right in and, and talk about this. So our objective here was to extend the ancestral lines of Virginia Estrada. And our starting point was we knew Mariano Estrada and Jovita Chavez 
were the parents of Virginia, born on the 7th of August, 1904 in Tira, Tira, Hopkins, Texas. So naturally, my first thing to do is to go to the U.S. Census records. The child's born in the U.S., so let's see what we can find in the census records. And here is that 1910 census. And you can see, I'll go ahead and blow this up for you so you can see it a little bit better. But here we have Miguel and Manuela Estrada and also living in the house are Mariano and this is Jovita, although they've butchered her name. And this is Virginia and Andrea and Teofila, Tomas. And then we have a couple of nephews, Juan and Felipe. I've got their ages. It tells me that, they, that they've been married once for six years and that she has had four children and four are still living. So these are my clues that I glean from the record. It also tells me that uh, Mariano was 30 and he was a coal miner. There's a lot of coal mining in Southern Texas back at this time period. And he arrived into the US in 1896. Jovita, who was listed as Jovas, and again, this probably is a language problem. She arrives in 1902, married six years, and as I mentioned, four years, um, four children, four still living in there, were all born in Texas. So as I look through there, there are some additional clues. Um, mother, Marie Castro, or Maria, probably is what it really is, 45, widowed, she says she's had 16 children. Two are still living. Man alive. She arrived in 1896. And then we have the nephews, Gabriel Perez, Juan Estrada, and Felipe Estrada. And then there are two boarders. And then, as I mentioned, we have a Miguel Estrada, who's in the same home with his wife, Manuela. So I would assume they're probably related since they're all living together. So I'm going to add him to my fan club. And then I'm ready to move on to my next searches. So my next steps are to look for more census searches. And I will tell you that I came up with a brick wall. I looked and looked and looked and could not find them for a good long while. I tried the vital records, which is something that I told you you need to do. So I went back and looked at the 1910 census again. And I took note of the neighbors and other family members and then I went back to the 1900 census and started looking for everybody that I'd found in 1910. And I was surprised. I found Mariano, but the wife is not Jovita. So I, I, I was a little hesitant. But as I look through the clues here, it says he's uh, married two years. He came in 1897. He's a coal miner. Well, that fits with what we saw in the previous census. But then I have Apollonia, and they ha she has two children, two living, and she came in 1897. So I'm guessing they may have come together. I've got Pedro here, born in 1896, arrived in 1897. Um, so he was obviously born in Mexico. And then I have Benita, and this should be Benito, a son. No, I'm, excuse me, it is Benita. That's a daughter. That's a typo on my part. Sorry about that. Um, she was born in Texas in March of 1900. And then I have Maria, the mother. And look what she says here. 16 children, three living. So it seems very well that this is the same family. But how do I explain the difference with the name of the wife? Um, here is the census record. And we can take a look at that. I'm going to go ahead and blow that up a little bit for you. So here's Mariano, and here's Apollonia, and then there's Pedro and Benita, and then there's Mother Maria. And I do like that it gives us the month and the birth year. I always take these with a grain of salt, though, because you never know. If they weren't literate, they might not have known their birthday. So keep that in mind. And then you'll notice up here, there's another Estrada, and they're living in the same household. Pio Quinto and wife Helena, and then we have Juanito and Felipe. All right, let's take a look at our clues. So Pio Quinto, he has been married nine years. He arrived in 1895. He's also a coal miner. So like occupation, same name. This has got to be a relative. And then I've got the wife, and she's two children, two living, and then I have Juanito and Felipe. Now, remember in the 19th census, we had a Juan and a Felipe Estrada who were nephews? Are these the same ones? Now, Juan fits very nicely with Juanito, but Felipe, his birth year's off a little bit, but 
who gave the information in the census? Are these the same young boys? It's highly likely. Let's take a look at the rest of the census. On the next page, I found Leocadia Estrada. This is a female. Uh, she's widowed. She's had six children, but only one is still living. And she also came in 1897. And guess what? Her son, Dolores, yes, Dolores can be a male name in Mexico, was also a coal miner. So all three families are living side by side in Manera, Webb County, Texas, and they're all coal miners. So what are my next steps? I'm going to go to the 1920 census. I couldn't find them. How about the marriage of Mariano and Apollonia? Or birth records for the children, Pedro in Mexico and Benita in Texas. I could also look and see if I could find any records for Maria. If she's living in Texas, maybe she died in Texas. I, I know she's Maria Castro. That's um, FYI, if you don't know, in Hispanic cultures, the women don't change their last name when they marry. If they're living, well, generally speaking, all the time, unless they move to the U.S. and then they may conform to U.S. standards, but they usually keep their maiden names. All right, so what were my results? I didn't find any census records. I did find the marriage of Mariano and Apollonia Villa in Webb County, Texas in 1898. I did not find any birth records for the children or any death records for the mother in Texas. So my next step is I'm going to go to that full fan club, the full family research, and I'm going to expand my search and I'm going to look for Pio Quinto Estrada, Leocadia Estrada, and, and Miguel Estrada. All of them were living in or near this Mariano Estrada's family, and so I want to see what I can learn about them. So I found a marriage for Pio Quinto Estrada and Elena, or Helena, remember the H is silent in Spanish, so don't get hung up because it doesn't start with an H when it did in the census. They were married in Webb County, Texas in 1896. I couldn't find any other records for Leocadia in Texas. And I did find Miguel named in his son's World War II draft record. So now I've got to think, take a look back, step back and see what else I can do. I've got to think outside the box a little bit. Now I decide I would like to search for Leocadia, who had the son Dolores in Mexico, who was born. I want to look for them in Mexico. I know he was 12 in the 1900 census. So I'm going to search in my search engines. I'm going to put in mother's name, Leocadia Estrada. I'm going to put in um, the child's name, Dolores. And then I'm just gonna kind of go, I did put in a year range, but put in some, go less is more is always my mantra because I wanna be able to sort through it. And sure enough, I find a Jose Dolores, Flores Estrada, Flores for his dad, who is Pablo, and Estrada for his mom. And they may have in the census just named him Estrada just because that's what mom's name was and they just, the census taker didn't wasn't aware of Hispanic customs and didn't assume that the son might have a different last name than his mother. So this is the, the record. And as I look at it, so here it says Jose Dolores, and it tells me that they were in Salitre. And I've got the names of Pablo Flores and Leocadia Estrada. I've got the godmother, Desideria Cortez. So I've got a location, but now I'm not sure if this is the same person or not. So I want to do a little bit more research. I decide to go and look at the civil birth record. Remember I mentioned to you that sometimes there's church and civil at the same time period. And this was the same case for Dolores. The interesting thing about this one, though, is in the civil record, he called the child Maria Dolores. And it says it was a hija legitima. The other thing that we've got here in this civil record is I've got the names of the grandparents, Demetrio Flores and Martina Chavez. So those are Pablo's parents. And I've got what looks like Zenon or Estrada and Perfecta Chavez as the parents of Leocadia. So, but my question is, um, the date is the same as the baptism record. Um, 
I did notice as I looked through this parish or this civil registration book that he did the scribe did a lot of records of births that day. Did he just mess up and call her him Dolores just because he thought Dolores should be a girl's name? I don't know the answer, but this is the extracted information. And one of the things that I was hoping to prove was that she was a sister to Mariano because remember Mariano's mother was Maria Castro from the census, but the maternal grandmother wasn't Maria Castro. So now, now I'm stuck back to going back to some of my other fan club members, the other full family members research. So let's go back and try Pio Quinto. He has a very unusual name. So uh, I like looking for guys when they have weird names like that. So I'm gonna try to find a birth record for him. And so I tried a, a bunch of searches, but what I did, oops, um, based, on, sorry, based on the information that I had, assuming that he, I'm testing my theory that Maria Castro is his mother and his dad is an Estrada. So that's what I put in my search fields. And lo and behold, I find one born in Venado, the same place as Dolores. And his father is Antonio Estrada, but the mother is Jesus Castro. Now I'm thinking, all right, is that la that's what it is. All right, I'm going to probably rush through this because we're almost out of time. Here is his baptism record, and I have the names of his parents, Antonio Estrada, Jesus Castro. I'm still not quite convinced. So then I do a search for his um, civil record. And then this time, it got, basically got the same information. I've got the names of his um, parents. But look who's the, one of the witnesses, Demetrio Flores and Esteban Chavez. Now we saw Demetrio as the pa father of Pablo. So I'm thinking there's a connection here and it's in Venado, the same place Dolores was, was born. So uh, what I learned from this is Leocadia and Pio Quinto are not siblings. I, are they the same people? My next step is to search for Miguel and Mariano in Venado because that's where I found these other two and do another combination search for Estrado and Estrada and Castro. And I did find a baptism for Mariano Estrada and it, same parents, Antonio Estrada, Jesus Castro. Um, then I found this civil registration indexed record. And this is why you wanna always look at it because this sure seems to fit, but look at the name of mom, that's not right. So when I go to the record, Maria Asuncion Martinez is the person who reported the birth. That's not the mom, the mom is listed down here. Maria Jesus Castro. So this was indexed incorrectly on both Ancestry and Family Search. So this really looks like my guy. Here's Miguel's baptism. Again, Antonio Estrada and Jesus Castro, also in Venado. So I found them, and I found that eight children between 1871 and 1883. Now there might've been more if she really did have 16. And I also discovered that Leocadia was an aunt of Mariano, sister of his father. So I had to expand my search, include all the members of the family. I had to do a little pedigree analysis, create a little timeline. Once I found a few records in a place, consider that, form a theory and consider that and test it out and exhaust all the possible records that I could find for life and fence. Consider all of the jurisdictions. Remember, not everything's online. And also consider record substitutes that you might find. These are all in your syllabus. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to zoom down to the end. And don't forget, there's some online sources for help that you can use. And we'd be happy to help you with an online consultation. So that is it for today. I'm going to turn my camera back on. And if you have questions, I'm happy to entertain them. If not, that's fine with me too. <laughs>